Hello everyone and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier and today we're having a look at another item that I brought back from my Washington DC trip, specifically a fascinating piece of vintage lab equipment. This is a Hewlett Packard Model 198A oscilloscope camera. This dates from the late 1960s and early 1970s and is exactly what it sounds like. See, in the days before digital data collection, if you wanted to capture a trace on your oscilloscope, either to process the data later or to include the image in your scientific report, you had to physically take a picture of the oscilloscope screen. And many companies, including Hewlett Packard, produced a variety of specialized cameras specifically for this purpose. So that's what we're going to have a look at today. Now, before we get started, I do need to mention that Hewlett Packard's product lines have always been very complicated and difficult to interpret. And all the information in this video comes from a handful of manuals, catalogs, and company journals that I was able to get my hands on. So if I miss a particular product or if I get a release date wrong, I apologize in advance. Please let me know in the comments and I will publish the appropriate corrections in the video description. Anyway, during the 1960s, Hewlett Packard manufactured four main models of oscilloscope cameras, the model 195A, the 196A, the 197A, and the 198A. And while release dates are a little bit hazy, as far as I've been able to determine, these were introduced in 1960, 1961, 1965, and 1969, respectively. Now, all of these models fundamentally comprised a light tight housing with a clamping mechanism at one end to attach the unit to an oscilloscope screen and a camera, typically a Polaroid land type, on the other with the controls dissected in order to move them to the outside of the housing. Now, the Model 195A released in 1960 was designed to take Polaroid 40 series roll film. This consisted of two separate rolls, one containing the emulsion and the other the developing chemicals, which once the film was exposed, you would pull out the side of the camera through a set of rollers. This would push the two film strips together and start the development process. If you want to learn more about how that works and Polaroid cameras during this era, please check out my three-part series on the history of Polaroid cameras. Now, like all Hewlett Packard oscilloscope cameras manufactured during this period, the Model 195A was designed for use with Hewlett Packard 180 series oscilloscopes, which included an interesting feature called a pulse flood gun. And this was a special electron gun in the cathode ray tube that would illuminate the entire screen when triggered. And this was to pre-fog the film in the camera in order to increase its sensitivity and capture very rapid transient traces like the ones that you would capture during a particle physics or nuclear experiment. You see, these pulses are so fast that the light wouldn't really be able to expose even the fastest film. So by pre-exposing the film, you are pushing that area of the film over its sensitivity threshold allowing even the fastest traces to be captured. And using ASA 10,000 film, the Model 195A was able to achieve a writing speed of 4 centimeters per nanosecond. Now, the Model 195A used an 80 millimeter f1.3 lens, had a shutter speed adjustable between 1 30th of a second and 4 seconds, and had an image reduction ratio of 2 to 1, allowing the entire oscilloscope screen to be captured. Now, the focus of the lens was adjustable, but there was no mechanism for determining the focus of the lens while the unit was attached to an oscilloscope. So what the manual recommended was that you lay the camera lens down on a sheet of graph paper and take a couple of test shots, this being a Polaroid, you could do that very quickly, to ensure that the lines on the graph paper were in focus. Now, since the clamping mechanism placed the oscilloscope screen 5 sixteenths of an inch from the nose of the camera housing, the manual further recommends that you use pencils, which happen to be 5 sixteenths of an inch thick, as spacers to hold the camera above the graph paper and ensure that you are focusing in the correct plane. Now, the mounting mechanism for the Model 195A was hinged so that you could swing the unit away and gain access to the oscilloscope screen. It could also be twisted 90 degrees to change the orientation of the photograph. Another neat feature was that the camera body could actually be moved vertically relative to the housing and locked in one of 11 detented positions. And this allowed you to capture multiple exposures on the same piece of film, either to compare different traces from different parts of an experiment or simply to economize on film. 
though I imagine this would have been very difficult, if not impossible, to use with the pulse flood gun in the oscilloscope activated, since flooding the film with light 11 different times would probably have bleached it out and rendered it useless. Now, in addition to the standard configuration of the 195A, Hewlett-Packard also offered a number of optional configurations at no extra charge. Option 1 included an integral UV light for use with oscilloscopes that didn't have their own internal pulse flood gun. And this would directly stimulate the phosphors in the oscilloscope screen post rather than pre-fogging the film in order to increase its sensitivity. It also produced a lighter background for the black graticule lines on the oscilloscope screen, which otherwise wouldn't show up in a photograph. Now, option two replaced the standard Polaroid roll film back with a universal Graflex film back, while option three replaced this with a Polaroid pack film back. Now, pack film was developed in 1962 and combined the emulsion and developer sections of the film into one unit, several of which were stacked inside a single rectangular cartridge. And again, to learn more about how that works, please check out my three-part series on Polaroid cameras. And then finally, option four could be run on a European-style 230-volt power source, as opposed to a North American-style 110-volt source. Now, the Model 196A, introduced in 1961, was very similar to the Model 195A and came in two basic varieties. A standard model where the shutter was manually actuated, and an H01 model where the shutter could be electronically triggered by an external signal, say the flash synchronization signal from another camera, or from the experiment that you're trying to record. It also took Polaroid 40 series roll film and had the same 11 position detent system for the camera body. The camera used a 75mm f1.9 lens with an aperture adjustable from f1.9 to f16 and a shutter adjustable from 1 100th of a second to half a second. The reduction ratio was 0.9 to 1. Other than that, however, this was a very basic model and no options were provided for alternate film backs, UV post fogging, or alternate power sources. The Model 197A, introduced in 1965, was the first to include UV post fogging and a Polaroid pack film back as standard. It incorporated all the same features as the 196A in addition to a variable image reduction ratio, which could be adjusted from 1 to 1 to 1 to 0.7 using a screwdriver. The camera used a 75mm f1.9 lens, aperture was adjustable from f1.9 to f16, and shutter speed was adjustable from 1 30th of a second to 4 seconds. And just like the Model 195A, the Model 197A came in four optional configurations. Option 1 eliminated the UV screen illumination lamp for a cost savings of $50. After all, if the oscilloscopes that you're already using have a pulse flood gun, why spend the extra money? Option 2 replaced the Polaroid pack film back with a universal graph lock film back. Option 3 was designed for use with 230 volt power supplies. And finally, option four went back to the old Polaroid roll film back. Uh, this is presumably if you already have a ton of roll film around, or all of your instruments are calibrated for the use of a specific type of film, things like that. And finally, we get to the Model 198A, introduced in 1969. And this differs from earlier models in three basic ways. Number one, it's entirely portable, being powered by batteries instead of an external wall plug. Number two, it eliminates the 11 position detent system for the camera back. And number three, it has a built in system for determining your lens's focus while the unit is clamped to the oscilloscope. So let's have a closer look at this and see how it works. Right, so as I said, this is battery powered. And if we remove this little panel on the side, we can see that it's powered by four C cell batteries. On the front, we have our clamping mechanism to attach this to an oscilloscope. This is covered by this protective cap. And to release that, you push this little lever back like that, and then the cap comes out. And you can see part of the camera inside, but we'll have a closer look at that when we actually remove top cover. So this is designed specifically for use with 5-inch Hewlett-Packard round or square oscilloscope bezels. Unfortunately, this is not one of those, so this will not clamp onto this particular oscilloscope, uh, but they did manufacture a bunch of different adapters for use with other companies' equipment. Now, if we turn this around, we'll see we have our Polaroid land film back. Uh, this is the chassis from a 100 to 400 series Polaroid land camera, like these two that I have in my collection here. 
but stripped of all of its external controls, including its rangefinder and viewfinder. Instead, we have a very simple little window with a green filter and a flip up door. And you would flip this closed when actually using the camera to prevent stray light from leaking inside. And so if we undo this little latch at the bottom here, we can swing open the back and we see our space here for loading our film cartridge and the set of rollers that you would pull the film through to start the development process. And finally, on the right side of the unit, we have all of our camera controls. So let's go from left to right and see what all of these do. So first we have a pair of jacks for shutter synchronization so that you can trigger the shutter using an external signal, either from another camera or from your experiment. And underneath this is our focus knob. And you can see as I turn this, what happens is that the entire Polaroid camera body moves in and out relative to the housing and thus moves closer or farther away from the oscilloscope screen. Moving forward, we have our aperture adjustment knob, which goes from f3.5 to f22. And forward of that, we have our shutter speed adjustment, which goes from 1 60th of a second up to one second. And we also have a B or bulb setting for long exposures. Above that is our shutter cocking lever, which you just pull forward like that to arm the shutter. And then we have a cable shutter release underneath. You just push down on the plunger to release the shutter. And then finally, at the front here, we have the controls for the screen illumination system. Now, unlike earlier models, this didn't use a UV lamp. It just has a regular incandescent bulb to illuminate the screen, both post-fogging the film and providing a contrasting background for the black graticles on the oscilloscope screen. So we have three positions here, off, flash, where the light only goes on when the shutter is triggered, and then continuously on, and then we have a little rheostat here to adjust the intensity of the light. This also forms part of the focusing system, but we'll have a look at that in just a second. For now, let's actually open up the case and have a closer look inside. All right, so if we remove that, we can see our dissected Polaroid land camera on the inside. And you can see that instead of the corrugated bellows that you would find on the commercial variants, here we just have a solid plastic cone since there's no need for the lens to fold up. And if I turn the focus knob again, you can see that the entire camera is mounted on a tray at the bottom of the housing that just moves back and forth. And I can show you some of the other little gear trains and other linkages that connect the controls on the camera, to the controls on the outside of the case. Now, interestingly, one little feature that they left buried inside the housing is this little lever, which is the camera's original self timer. So if I push that down and hit the cable release, and you'll see that it'll count down for about 10 seconds before activating the shutter. Now I can see why they left this as sort of a vestigial feature. There's really no use for a self timer like this in a laboratory setting. You're going to want very precise timing for the shutter. Uh, as for why they left it in, I guess it was easier to do that since you're using standard parts from commercial cameras rather than to remove it. Now if we look at the front here, we can see our screen lighting system. Now the light bulb that you can see here is actually just a spare. The real light bulb is underneath this little housing. And as you can see, light comes out windows on the side of the housing, bounces off these two mirrors, and is projected onto the oscilloscope screen. Now, this not only illuminates the screen for improving film sensitivity and improving contrast and things like that, but also serves as the focusing system for the camera. So when this is clamped onto the oscilloscope, what you do is you open up the little view window at the back, and you look at the two curtains of light projected by those two mirrors. And as you move the focus knob back and forth, those curtains are going to move in and out. And when those two curtains of light just about touch, that means the camera is in focus and it's ready to use. So really quite an elegant and clever system. And that is a brief technical overview of oscilloscope cameras of the 1960s. Now, I fully acknowledge that this is a very niche and obscure topic, but to my mind, this fits perfectly with the mission of this channel, which is to show clever vintage solutions to problems that we take for granted today because they're very easily solved using computers and other digital technologies. Today, if you want to capture data from an oscilloscope, you simply plug it into your laptop 
And there it is for you to analyze and manipulate at to your heart's content. Whereas in the past, they had to come up with very specialized and clever solutions like these to accomplish the same task. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time on another video where we'll look at yet more goodies from my DC trip and other fascinating devices. Uh, before we end off, though, I do want to mention that a couple of episodes ago, I ran a contest where if I got over 150 Patreon subscribers, then I would raffle off the candle-powered LED lantern featured in that video. Unfortunately, I didn't get to 150 patrons by June 1st, so nobody wins the lantern. But also, Patreon informs me that I'm not allowed to run raffles as an incentive, so I'll try to come up with another contest at a later date. Anyways, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.